And in Romans 15 is about receive the weak. You need to receive the weak. Let's begin at verse 1, the first major section. There's really three major sections to chapter 15. The first of those beginning at verse 1 and going through verse 12. It's some continued admonitions to the strong brethren. Pick up with me in verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. So he's beginning here in chapter 15, or continuing here in chapter 15 rather, the same thought he's he's given back in chapter 14. If you remember from last week's study in chapter 14, Romans 14, he made the point in the first 12 verses of Romans 14 about the fact that they needed to receive the weak and not be a stumbling block to those who are weak. Remember in Romans 14 and in verse 1 real quick, because we're still continuing the same thought here in chapter 15. Romans 14 and in verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. So he tells us to receive the one weak in the faith. He tells us then in, in, in 13, Therefore let us not judge one another, but let us resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall on a brother's way. And so in chapter 14... He began making the point about you need to receive the weak and you don't need to be a stumbling block to the weak. He's continuing that thought here in chapter 15. And he says, we who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. The very point of chapter 14 through chapter 15 and in verse 12 is he's making the point is that you need to to look out for the interest of the others, not just for yourselves. If you remember in chapter 13, where we covered a couple of weeks ago, in chapter 13, we were told, oh, no one anything except to what? To love. And then in chapter 14, he says, receive the weak. And then in chapter 15, he says, receive the weak. Not to dispute over doubtful things, not to, uh, but instead to bear with the scruples of the weak. And not to please yourself. So what he's saying, backing up into chapter 14 and on into chapter 15, is really continuing from his thought at the end of 13, is you love one another. Now when you come to 14 and 15, and you have one who who you disagree with, the one who is considered weak in his conscience, as it was pointed out at the end of chapter 14 and verses 22 and 23, about the one who's condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith, it's his conscience. He feels guilty. He feels guilty for what he did. But what we need to do is we need to make sure we receive them and that we're not looking out for our own interest, but looking out for the interest of our brethren. Look at verse two. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And so we need to receive the one who is weak. We need to not bear with the scruples. Again, continuing chapter 14, start on in here in chapter 15. And we do so on the basis of love. It's not that, that, you know, if you look at the end of 14 and you see all the things that, he, that he's made the point about not being a stumbling block and he's continuing is, is just because you have the right to do something and your brother or sister in Christ does not, specifically in this text in 14 and 15, and 14 is talking about the observing of days and the eating of meats, then just because they don't feel that they can eat that meat doesn't mean because you know you can that you have them over and you fix the meat. Because you have that liberty. You think because I have that liberty, I can exercise that. But he's telling them that they're not looking out not to please themselves. Just because you have that right does not mean you need to cause your brothers to stumble. But please his neighbor for his good, verse 2. But then beginning at verse 3, he gives Christ as the chief example of that. Look beginning in verse 3. For even Christ did not please Himself. You see, you don't need to please yourself, but please your neighbors, verses 1 and 2. Receive the weak, bear with your scruples, don't please yourselves, for Christ did not please Himself, verse 3. As it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And so he's making the point in verse 3, Christ was not, the goal for Christ was not to please himself. In fact, it's, he quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Christ's goal was not to please himself. And then in verse 4, this, this thought continues to verse 12, but I want us to come into verse 4 real quick. Look at verse 4. 
For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. In verse 4, and we always go to verse 4, and we talk about the things written aforetime were written for our learning, but I want you to understand this and appreciate it in the context. He quotes from Old Testament Scripture, from the book of Psalms in verse 3, and makes application to Christ. Look again in verse 3. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. He quotes from the Old Testament Scripture, and he makes application to Christ. And then says the things written aforetime are written for our learning, verse 4. The Old Testament Scripture is there for our learning. And in this case, he's quoting about a passage referring to Christ and saying, here, we're to learn from this. The reproach of those who approached you fell on me. That's referred to Christ. And there are things that we can learn from the things written aforetime. Notice something else he points out in this text. Not only the things written aforetime, he says that we through the patience and comfort of Scriptures might have hope. The patience and comfort of the Scriptures. Now look at verse 5. Now may the God of... What does he refer to God of? Him that is the God of. Patience and comfort. God is the God of patience, of comfort, patience and comfort. How is He the God of patience and comfort? He's long-suffering. Notice again here in the text, though, where where he's pointing out he's the God of patience and comfort through the Scriptures. Look at verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort... See, God is the God of patience and comfort because His Scriptures bring patience and comfort. Patience and comfort. But here's what he wants God to grant them. Grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. They need to be like-minded. The brethren need to be like-minded. They need to have the same mind. They need to be united. The problem he's dealing with in chapter 14 and in the first part of chapter 15 are there are those who are taking their liberties. The things that, that it's not wrong in and of itself. But it's not commanded, it's not necessary. The eating of meats, the observing of days, as he deals with in chapter 14. And, and, and they're divided. And they've got to remember that they've got to be like minded. Now, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like minded. We need to be like minded. We need to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. Listen to verse 6. That you may be with one mind and one mouth. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're of one mind, then you can glorify God with one mouth. Verse 6. You have one mind, according to verse 5. You're like-minded. Then when you have the one mind, you can glorify our God and Father with one mouth. Verse 6. Six. Verse 7, Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Again, he's coming back to the point that we need to receive one another just as Christ has received us. Receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I see that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. I want you to notice here. In verse 7, receive one another as Christ has received us. Now listen to how he descri- How does he describe Christ in verse 8? He's a servant. He is a servant. The term is used in verse 8 referring that he has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of of God to confirm the promises made to the Father. So he's a servant to the circumcision. But I think when we drop down into verse 9, we get the indication that he's a servant, that, that it's not stated but implied he's a servant to the circumcision, that's the Jews, and he's a servant to the uncircumcision, to the Gentiles. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written. And then he quotes from the Old Testament Scripture, and we'll go through that in a moment. 
But he's become a servant, according to verse 8, to the circumcision. And then in verse 9, that the Gentiles might glorify God. He's confirmed the promises in verse 8. And the Gentiles can glorify God for His mercy. He's become a servant to both the circumcised and to the uncircumcised. As it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among, will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. And so, he then quotes from some Old Testament Scriptures to point out that the Gentiles can be saved. They're praising God for His mercy. For this reason, they can confess you among the Gentiles and sing your name. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. Verse 10, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Verse 11, And He shall reign over the Gentiles, and in in Him the Gentiles shall hope. Verse 12, And so, the Gentiles have hope in Jesus Christ. He's pointing out in verses 8 through 12. But but he's really been pointing out this to show that Christ has received us. Christ has received those that were circumcised who obeyed the gospel, those who were uncircumcised who obeyed the gospel. And just as he has received us, we ought to receive one another. And that's the point he's making in verses 1 through 12. Verse 13. Verse 13 is the second section. This is a prayer of Paul. It's one of Paul's prayers. Paul, Paul offers many prayers in, in, throughout the New Testament. As you go into the writings of Paul, you'll see a lot of times that he says, My prayer for you. This is my prayer for you. Or he'll use some other term referring to the fact that he's praying for them and what his prayer for the brethren is. We'll see those terms used... Time and time again. We'll look at a couple of those this weekend as we study about prayer. We'll look at some examples of some prayers of Paul from time to time. But here's Paul's prayer here in verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Just as a side note, if, real quick before, before we move on, go back with me to verse 5. If you, if you highlight in your Bible, you might want to underline this. Verse 5. The God of patience and comfort. You might want to underline that or or circle that or highlight that in verse 5. Now when you come to verse 13, here he's referred to as the God of hope. You might want to underline that. And then when we get to the end of the book in verse 33, or the end of the chapter in verse 33, you might want to underline this phrase, God of peace. Now he's pointing out in this chapter, as he's talked time and time again, Here's several things he said. He said God is the God of patience and comfort, verse 5. He's the God of hope, verse 13. And He's the God of peace, verse 33. You just might want to underline that. Just keep that in note as you move through the text the way he refers to God. Verse 13. He's the God of hope. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. He wants them to be filled with joy and to be filled with peace. But how are they filled with joy and peace according to this text? How are they filled, according to verse 13, with joy and peace? There's a power of the Holy Spirit. How else were they filled with 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 joy and peace? In believing. In believing and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, the second part of that is that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So they must them to be filled with joy and peace. And that's done in believing. You're filled with joy and hope when you believe. And they could abound in hope. They can abound in hope. Remember, God is the God of hope. And when they have this joy and peace in the first part of verse 13, and they can abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the last half of verse 13. <coughs> so this is Paul's prayer for them in verse 13. Paul's prayer is that you be filled with joy and peace and believing and may abound by in hope. But beginning at verse 14 and going through the end of the chapter, where we'll spend the rest of our time, is Paul's discussing his work and plans. Paul discusses his work and plans beginning at verse 14. Really, a few major sections here. Two major sections to this part. 
14 through 21 is the reason for the letter. Pick up with me in verse 14. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. So in verse 14, he says he's confident concerning them. They're filled with goodness and filled with knowledge and they're able to admonish one another. But he's still, and he's still, verse 15, is writing to them to remind them. This is the importance of a reminder. Peter, when he writes his second epistle, in 2 Peter talks about stirring them up by way of reminder. Paul here is talking about reminding them. You know, as reminding you. It's not that you don't know this, but I'm reminding you. Why is it important that we be reminded of, of things? Why is it important to be reminded of things that you may already know? It's human nature to forget. Yeah, good point. He's, he's, he's talked about four references, and he, and he's told them too throughout the, the you know throughout the book time and time again about the acceptance of the Gentiles and rejection of the Jews, and he's had to remind them time and time again. He's reminding them of the fact that they're justified by faith through grace, not because they're so great and because of the deeds that they have done. What he's doing in this epistle is not telling them something new. He's reminding them of the things they already knew because they needed to be reminded. They needed to be reminded. Because we have the tendency to forget, we need to be reminded from time to time of some things that we know. Just because we know something doesn't mean we can't forget it. You know, the Bible warns time and time again, especially in the Old Testament to the people of Israel, you know, beware lest you forget. If you remember, in the book of Deuteronomy that it was told to the people of Israel to beware lest when you come into the land, you forget. When you settle in these houses that you did not build and you take of the vineyards that you did not plant, beware lest you forget. That's what they're told in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at Hosea chapter 13. Hosea chapter 13. If you make a note in your Bible, you might want to make a note out beside Hosea 13 and in verse 6. And right beside it, Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12. Go to Deuteronomy 6 and make a note referencing it to Hosea 13, 6. Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12 is that passage in Deuteronomy, or one of the passages that tells them don't forget. Hosea 13 and verse 6 says that when they had, had pasture, they were filled. When they were filled and their heart was exalted... That's fitting the description he's talked about in Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12. Therefore, they forgot me. You know, Israel had been warned time and time again under the old law about, about all the things that they would, they would be punished if they forgot, yet they forgot. And then Paul is writing here to the brethren at Rome saying, listen, I know you know this, but I'm reminding you of these things because of the grace given to me by God. I need to remind you of things that you already know so you don't forget. So sometimes we need to be reminded. Sometimes we study a topic that we've studied time and time again. Why do we study topics like baptism over and over again? We know that. We know about the work of the church. We know about all that. Why do we study this stuff time and time again? Because we need to make sure we don't forget. We need to be reminded of it time and time again. Pick up with me in verse 16 that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, and the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So he's told them in verse 15, I'm writing to you to remind you in verse 16, that, and he talks about verse 16, that I am a minister to the Gentiles. Therefore I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God, that I will not 
that I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum, I have preached, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I want you to notice what he says in verse 19. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. You know, when Paul is, is writing or teaching, he's teaching at Rome, or he's writing at Rome, or he's teaching in Jerusalem, or Antioch, or any of these other places, because he makes the point from Jerusalem and round about to Lyricum, I have fully preached the gospel. What he's saying is, I've preached the entirety of the gospel and I've preached it everywhere I've been. I'm reminded in Acts chapter 20, <coughs> in Acts chapter 20, when he's giving his address to the Ephesian elders, how he makes the point in Acts 20 that he's not shunned, that he's preached the whole gospel. That I'm innocent, verse 26 of, uh, of Acts 20, that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. No matter where Paul went, Paul taught the same thing and he taught the, the, the gospel in its entirety. Paul taught them the entire gospel. He taught it to the Jews. He taught it to the Gentiles. So as he's writing to them for the reason of the letter, he's reminding them, in, this, in the purpose of his writing, he's writing to remind them that as he as a minister to the Gentiles has taught the full gospel, whether to the Jews or to the Gentiles, whoever he's taught to, that they could be accepted. And so I made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to him who was not announced they shall see, to him he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. And so he says in verses 20 and 21, my goal was to teach, but my goal is to teach the gospel in places where the gospel is yet to go. Lest I build on another man's foundation. Paul was teaching the gospel, but Paul desired to teach the gospel in places that might not have yet received the gospel so that everyone could hear the gospel. He says, but lest I build on anyone else's foundation, but when he takes it to these other places, to him who was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. He's taking the gospel to every place. The purpose for Paul's writing is to remind them that he's taught the gospel, the entirety of the gospel, to every creature. He's taught the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles alike, and he's taught it in its entirety. Beginning at verse 22, he then talks about his coming to Rome. Now we know <coughs> from the study of the book of Acts that he never made it to Rome as he planned. He does make it to Rome, but he makes it to Rome as a prisoner. But this is his plans before he is a prisoner, before he, is taken, before he goes to Jerusalem and he's taken as a prisoner. This is his original plans to come to Rome. Verse 22. For this reason I have been much hindered from coming to you. The, the reason he's been much hindered for this reason seems to be the same reason he's writing to them is because he's been busy preaching and teaching the gospel to every creature. Because he's been busy preaching and teaching the full gospel to those who have not heard the gospel. There's an established church at Rome. There is a church at Rome, obviously, he's writing to them. But he's not come to Rome because he's busy teaching the gospel to those who have yet to hear the gospel. Again, back up to verse 19. I fully preached, you know, the mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I fully preached the gospel. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build it on another man's foundation. And the quotation from Old Testament Scripture, to him to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and to those who have not heard, they shall understand. For this reason, I also have been, my, have been much hindered from coming to you. Remember in chapter 1, he's given some reasons he's been hindered. Chapter 1, he's talked about his desire to come to them and being hindered from coming to them into this point. But he's also saying here in chapter 15, for this reason I also have been hindered. I'm also hindered because I'm busy teaching and preaching the gospel to those who have yet to hear the gospel. But there is a plan to come. His plan is to journey to Spain. When I journey to Spain, verse 24, I shall come to you. <coughs> 
Back up to verse 23. But no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire for many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. So his hope is to come to them as he is on his way to Spain. According to verses 22, or 25, or 23 and 24. But he must first go to Jerusalem. He must first go to Jerusalem. Pick, pick up with me in verse 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. <coughs> for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Jews have been partakers of their spiritual, or the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. So he's talking here about the contribution to the needy saints. This is the same contribution to the needy saints that is talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And Paul is saying, I've been getting this to take to the needy saints that are at Jerusalem, those that are in need. We're gathering it and taking it to those that are in need. After I take it and I, after I get this and I take it to Jerusalem, then I'm going to travel to Spain and come to you. Then I'm going to travel to Spain and come to you. I want you to notice a couple of key things here. Number one, it was for the needy saints. It was for the saints. What he was gathering together was not just for those in Jerusalem, but it was for the saints. Look at verse 20, uh, 25. Going to minister to the saints. Look again in verse 26. To make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints. So what he's getting, what he's taking to Jerusalem, what they're getting, what's, what's being gathered together in Macedonia and Achaia is being taken to the saints. What that tells me is the church can help those that are needy saints, but they can only help those that are needy saints. That's all we have the example of in scripture of them helping are those that are Christians. They could help the saints, but they could only help the needy saints. But look also in verse 27. The Gentiles have become partakers with the Jews of the spiritual, therefore the Gentiles shall share with the Jews or minister to the Jews in material. The Jews and the Gentiles are partakers together of the spiritual things. And because they partake together in the spiritual, the Gentiles, he's pointing out in verse 27, should be willing to help the Jews with their material needs. We need to be willing to help our brethren. That's another important lesson we learn in verse 27. We're sharing together in the things that are spiritual. We're partaking together in the things that are spiritual. We need to be willing to help those that are in need to minister to them when it comes to their material needs. Pick up at verse 29. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayer... Or with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. A couple of things he points out here. Number one in verse 30, an important lesson for us all to learn is we need to strive together with each other in prayer. We need to strive together with one another in prayer. He's requesting from the brethren at Rome that they pray for him as he journeys to Jerusalem and to Judea that he could be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. And so, he's requesting the prayers. What we learn in this is we need to pray for those who are Christians. We need to pray for those who are teaching and preaching the gospel, especially in difficult places. We need to pray that maybe they'll be delivered from suffering. Pray that they could endure, if not delivered, that they could at least endure suffering, the suffering. That they could stand firm. We need to pray for them, and we need to pray together. They're praying together. He's not saying here that they're gathered together like what we pray before, before worship, during worship services or before a Bible class. But they're praying for the same thing. 
You know, when we pray for the same thing, when we're making the same request that you may pray for it at your house and I may pray for it at mine, we're striving together in prayer. That's what he points out in verse 30. They're not together in the same place, but they're praying for the same thing. They're striving together in prayer. Verse 32 and 33, as he finally says, I will come to you. That I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And so he's pointing out in verses 32 and 33 that though this, you know, I've been delayed so far, but I plan to come after, uh, when I come to Spain, after I go to Jerusalem, then I can come to you. He points out in verse 32 though that he wants to come to them that he may be refreshed together with them. You know, we can be refreshed by our brethren, by seeing our brethren, by being together, we can be refreshed. He could be refreshed by them and they could be refreshed by Him. Are we refreshed when we gather together to worship God? When we come together, are we refreshed to see our brethren? To see others who are striving to do what is right and to serve God faithfully? Are we refreshing one another? That's an important question we need to ask ourselves. Let's talk about some practical lessons we've learned. We've gone through that rather quickly this morning. Let's talk about some practical lessons. What are some practical lessons y'all see in this text? What just stands out to you as we move through Romans chapter 15? Right. We need to be reminded and those things need to be reinforced. And that's a good point. Not just, not just reminded, not just because we forget, but, but it can strengthen us when we're reminded of those things. When we hear the same things again and again, it can encourage us. You know, being reminded, uh, aside from the fact that it keeps us from forgetting, does strengthen us because it can remind us too that God's Word doesn't change. It's still the same. What I heard on this topic, you know, ten years ago is what I heard today. As long as it's true to Scripture, what the Bible so always, what the Bible says now is what it said ha, ha, has always said, and so that that can bring us comfort. That's a good point. What else do we see in this text? Right. We see the care and concern. And there was the differences that there was the differences in their opinions there in chapters fourteen and the first part of chapter fifteen, but they're still commanded to receive one another. They need to receive one another in spite of those differences because it wasn't a matter uh, of doctrine that's violated. You know, it's not like it's a matter of, of, of the scriptures say this and this is what's going on. We'll see that in a couple of weeks when we get into chapter sixteen. Where he talks about noting those that cause divisions. According to doctrine. But we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with people that have a difference of opinion. In chapters 14 and 15, when we have a difference of opinion, uh, uh, these things that are not of the utmost importance, then we need to make sure we're receiving one another and showing love towards one another. Here's some other things we learned. We all not to please ourselves. It's closely connected with that point. We all not to please ourselves. Again, verse 1. We who are strong ought to bear with the scriptures of the weak and not to please ourselves. Our desires are not to please ourselves. Our desires should not be to please ourselves. That wasn't the desire of Christ. Christ, for even Christ did not please himself according to verse 3. So we are not trying to please ourselves. We need to please one another. We need to be striving to edify one another and not to please ourselves. Here's something else we learn. Verse 4. The things written before were written for our learning. People, sometimes the question is asked, why do we study the Old Testament? Why is it we're studying through Judges on Wednesday night? Why is it we're going through the Old Testament on Wednesday night? You know, we're not under the old law anymore. No, but there are some important lessons we learn. There are some important lessons we learn from the Old Testament. We may not be under the old law anymore, but there are things that we learn that are very important lessons for us. So we go through the Old Testament and we study those lessons, you know, some of the first lessons we probably all learned as children were Old Testament stories. Probably stories like Noah. Maybe about Abraham. Cain and Abel. 
Well, the first stories we learned were Old Testament stories because we learned the principles early on. Things were written before were written for our learning. We can learn a lot in the Old Testament. Something else, I pointed this out earlier. We learned this, the, the phrases used to refer to God. In verse 5, he's referred to as the God of patience and comfort. In verse 13, he's the God of hope. And in verse 33, he's the God of peace. God is the God of patience, comfort, hope, and peace. So there's some things we need, so, so we need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded that he's the God of patience, he's the God of comfort, he's the God of hope, and he's the God of peace. I learned that the contribution that was gathered together was for the saints in verse 25. And now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. This contribution wasn't for just anyone, it was for the needy saints. So the church can help and only help the needy saints. They can't help just anyone, but they can only help the needy saints. And then also in verse 32, we we should be refreshing one another. We should be refreshed by our brethren when we gather together. And again, as I pointed out a minute ago, we need to ask that question from time to time. Are we refreshed by our brethren when we see them? Do our brethren refresh us? Are we refreshing them? It's important that we make sure we're refreshing one another. So let's make sure we refresh one another. Thank you for your attention this morning.